Welcome to the Terror Dome. Here we are. This is going to be part two, the first real entry in my ongoing series about artificial intelligence black goo, a entity, substance, cultural phenomena that as of late has been taking the conspiracy theory, truther movement, new age community, spiritual community, a little bit by storm. Um, so that's what prompted the making of these videos. As I covered briefly in my introductory video, we're going to be concentrating on the YouTube channel operated and named after, maybe named after just his personal YouTube channel, of Miles Johnston. Um, this will be good because it's a great resource to use. It's got a ton of information. A lot of the people involved in Black Goo have appeared, and also the basis projects are an ongoing series of conferences and lectures and interviews that are numbered. So I'll be able to easily tell you we're talking today about Bases 17. Bases 17 is where we're starting because it's the first instance that I'm aware of where the issue of black goo was really put forward, maybe not on the internet, but certainly, I think, on the Bases project. Now, I should say this. Miles Johnston uh, clearly has some personal feelings about black goo. May have been have, an, have some eyewitness experience. Not, maybe he def definitely has some eyewitness experiences. Um, so it's very possible that he introduced the subject of black goo or alien, er, artificial intelligence black goo at an earlier time. But this is the first one that clearly clearly talks about the issue. Basis 17 features an investigative reporter by the name of or researcher by the name of David Griffin. Um, a very pleasant chap. I think he's. I think he might be British. Um, and um, David Griffin in Basis 17, which uh, goes on to several parts. Basically, there's it's delineated into into four parts. Parts one and two, where we're going to be spending the most time, is one video. Okay. Then there's a part three and a part four video that we're going to be talking about briefly because it doesn't contain quite the same detailed amount of information. It's more about speculation, a little bit of repetition of material that came before. So if one were to only watch one of the bases 17, I would definitely say watch the long one that incorporates parts one and two. That's all you need to do. We will talk about three and four, but if you press for time and can't investigate the issue as fully as you, as you feel you might need to, bases 17, part one and two with David Griffin is where you want to go and where we're going to be concentrating our time. David Griffin, as a researcher, uh, and particularly in, in, this, in this chapter, in bases 17, is going to be talking a lot about black goo, artificial intelligence black goo, and its connection to the Falklands War conflict. He's also going to follow that up. He, basically, his theory is that the Falklands War between Britain and, and uh, Argentina, uh, the political things that we've been told about are actually false, and the real reason that the Brits uh, invaded the Falklands Islands in 1982 was to retrieve this artificial intelligence black goo from an underground base located under the Argentinian base known as Corbeta Uruguay. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Forgive me if I'm not. He follows his line of research on into what's known as the Marconi deaths. Marconi is a small, it was, well, it's not small, it's an, it's an English electronics corporation that's heavily involved in the defense industry in Great Britain. Uh, during the 80s, there was a series of dramatic series of unexplained and inexplicable mur you know, suicide, murder-suicides, very unusual, called the Marconi deaths, that was covered uh, in a book called uh, Open Verdict by, a researcher, by another investigative journalist by the name of Tony Collins. It is David Griffin's theory that the, these Marconi deaths are not related to any sort of other Cold War espionage, but rather are related to the ongoing investigation and the Brits' investigation and exploration of this black goo. Got the black goo from Argentina, ferry it back to Britain, okay, put it in the hands of Marconi Corporation to to experiment on it, try to talk to it, program it, whatever they're gonna do with it, and you know, these deaths ensue because these people can't handle it. You know, this black goo's gonna drive them crazy. The cast of characters are David Griffin, as we've already discussed. Okay. Oh, and then after we talk about the Marconi deaths in part four, uh, he goes on and connects the Gulf oil disaster to this as well. Okay. Miles Johnson is going to feature heavily as one of the interviewers. Um, I think it's safe to say that Miles Johnson considers himself a, you know, he's definitely psychically attuned. Uh, he's, I believe, I don't think that I'm painting him with the wrong brush if I say that he could be considered a light worker. Okay. And it's very important to know that I'm not making a, any sort of personal testimony about whether or not I accept or don't accept. I'll say that I'm agnostic as to whether or not they're, they're, 
light workers, you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I think that there are. I think Miles Johnson probably is one. But it's important to note that because in addition to his eyewitness uh, experiences with black goo, he also, I think, is able to identify or see it or believes that he sees it in his etheric state, which might be an invisible state. I, it's kind of confusing. Uh, he's a good guy. I like this guy. Uh, the other cast of characters are going to be uh, Miss Summerscales, who is the leader of the, the Amok project that used to be closely associated with the Basis project, but now these guys have gone their separate ways. Miles Johnson's, I believe her name is Suzanne Summerscales. Forgive me if I got the name the name wrong. I apologize. I, I tried it down out of memory. Um, uh, she, I guess she's doing her own thing, and he's doing his own thing now. But today they're, they're here together interviewing David Griffin. Now, there's a very other important person that you need to know about in order to understand David Griffin, his research, and this import of the story and the, the impact or how you're going to judge David Griffin's conclusions. David Griffin's primary source for the existence of an underground base underneath Corbata, Uruguay, right? The uh, political the political rationale being false for the Argentine, you know, the Falklands War conflict, um, as well as the connection, I believe, to the Marconi deaths and forward, is a, is a contactee, ad abductee, by the name of Alec Newwald. Alec Newwald is a, was an engineer, or may still be an engineer, who was abducted sometime in 1989, okay? And he was gone for 10 days. He was taken to Haven with the aliens, and they taught him all this shit, including um, stuff, including, that's not judgment, that was just, you know, the way I talk, um, they told him all this stuff about the Falklands conflict, the existence of this base, and as well as, I believe, some information regarding these Marconi deaths. As I mentioned, there's also Miss Summerscales, who will be participating quite often in the direct examination and interview of David Griffin. Okay, let's start with the Falklands War conflict and get some understanding of the basic history of the Falklands War conflict uh, so we can see and chart where David Griffin diverges, okay? That will help us understand things, okay? I'm going to do this very briefly, and I'm certainly not going to read the Wikipedia article, so we're just going to basically say this, what people probably already know. There was a small chain of volcanic islands off the coast of Argentina known as the Falkland Islands. It's also sometimes called, I think, the Malvides Islands or the Malvides Islands. There's two, I believe, two island chains. One of the island chains is known as Southern Thule Island Chain. That's important. We'll talk about that in their name to avoid any confusion because it's really not controversial. Okay, the Falkland Islands. Uh, Argentina always wanted the Falkland Islands. They really think it's their territory. The Brits have other feelings about it. In fact, the majority of people on the Falkland Islands are English-speaking descendants of British uh, settlers. So the Falkland people really always thought, kids really considered themselves part of the United Kingdom. Okay, the United Kingdom thinks they're part of the United Kingdom, but Argentina thinks that it's theirs. Okay. Um, sometime, and I believe in the in 1976, in order to, but it, this is an ongoing conflict, and this didn't start in the 70s or 80s. The Argentina and, and Britain have, have constantly kind of butted heads over this region. Okay, so uh, Argentina goes to the uh, who constantly and consistently asserts uh, control ownership over the the Falkland Islands, sets up a small scientific base. Um, I guess you could call it a military base as part of their, but it's really a scientific outpost um, on, a, on, a, on a part of the uh, southern Thule Island chains known as Thule Island. It's a volcanic island, um, and they did this in about 1976. Shortly after they set it up, you know, Britain found out about it, discovered about it, but tried to negotiate with them peacefully to try and figure out what they're going to do. Okay. Uh, in 1982... Diplomatic uh, relations having fall, uh, diplomatic uh, talks having fallen and faltered, Britain invades. Okay, it's very important to understand that even though it's the Britain has a decisive victory in a, in, a, in a, sh a relatively short period of time, but not an instant. This is not Granada. This is not overnight. Okay, and many many hundreds of soldiers die. This is a real war. Okay, it's very important that people understand that these are. This was a real war where real soldiers fighting for their nation gave their lives. Very important to be respectful of that, I personally believe. Okay. Uh, 19, uh, 1982, the UK invades. They obtain a relatively quick victory, but it's not, it's not, like I said, it wasn't bloodless. And I'll tell you another thing, okay? Even though 
it's common to conceive of the Falkland Wars as being, you know, Britain going in and, and like kicking Argentina's ass or being unfair to Argentina or just blowing them out or just overreacting. Argentinian military is no fucking joke. These guys are, these are, the Argentinian army are no effing joke. You better believe that those Royal Marines who went in, those generals who led their men into the invasion of the Falkland Islands, which wasn't easy for Britain to do because uh, it's it, it's not it's not a great place to invade. It's a small series of islands. You got to do multiple landings. You got to do amphibious uh, combat and and tactical uh, you know um, embarkation onto the land. These are things that any military strategist will tell you. People still talk about the Falklands War. Man, this is this was a hard thing for the Brits to do. Because you better believe that those young men flying under the Union Jack knew that they were not going into some sort of dress-up uh, police action. That it wasn't going to be just, you know, Woody Allen's bananas. That these guys were going to have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these Argentinians. And these Argentinians, you know, they're, they're basically, they're trained by the crowds. I mean, these guys, the Argentinian military is no effing joke, okay? The huge, huge, you know, German uh, population that came over, um, you know, uh, after World War One, bringing with them all their knowledge, all their uh, you know, knowledge of, of Prussian war tactics and the Kaiser's war tactics. The Argentinians are no effing joke. And the Brits should be very proud of their victory. I don't say that. I think everyone should be, you know, proud of, of themselves because they achieved the victory. It's terrible. I'm not pro-war, but people got to do what they got to do. we got to play out our karma and our dharma, and I guess a warrior's got to be a warrior. It is what it is. But I just want to put that in perspective because it's very common for people to act like, oh, the Brits, like, you know, either that either like it was some sort of joke. It's no joke to fight the Argentinians, man. To, you know what I mean? The U.S. military had to invade Argentina, okay? We'd be all like, oh, it'd be easy. Uh-uh. Argentina, you know, even with all their financial problems, we're not going to get too far. Anyway, in June 20th of 19, you remember the, 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 the base, uh, the, the war happens, the war takes place, the United Kingdom wins. The British soldiers are victorious, um, and that's the end of the conflict. Shortly after the end of the conflict, on June 20th, 1982, the Brits uh, actively take Corbata, Uruguay. Okay, there's a, an amphibious assault with a complement of Royal Marines uh, accompanied by, I believe, a nuclear sub and an icebreaker. Okay, now we'll get to that because it's important to talk about how much tech they brought to take Corbata, Uruguay. It'll be relevant to people. Okay, shortly after the war ends, they go and they take Corbata, Uruguay. They take the soldiers, the Argentinian soldiers give up. They don't fight. They don't put up a fight. They surrender immediately the minute the Brits arrive. And the Brits, you know, kick them offshore, and they basically leave Corbata, Uruguay intact. Why? Corbata, Uruguay is nothing fancy. Got a visual aid here. The crappiest visual aid ever. Hopefully I'll be able to put this JPEG and make this maybe the um, thumbnail. But you see, you know, Corbata, Uruguay is a series of prefab structures, okay? These are clearly prefab structures used by any military. And like any, any prefab structure constructed hastily, in a, in a in a in an Antarctic, you know, the Falkland Islands are very near the Antarctica. It's not it's not a warm place. It's not you know it's, it's cool. It's chilly. It's chilly. It's cold. It's cold. So the island is a volcanic island. It's covered in permafrost, right? And anyone who knows anything about um, you know military construction or just construction in in frozen barren places in general, you got to build prefab structures on pylons. These are pylons which raise the structures off the ground. Why do you do that? Well, number one, it's too hard to dig into this volcanic, so it's too hard to dig into this soil, especially if you want to construct something fast. You know, you can't do a huge construction job. Also, because it's permafrost, right, in Siberia, there's many Russian cities that are all built on pylons, okay, and that's because permafrost raises and lowers the um, the height of the ground. It makes a you know, traditional you know, basement or sub-basement based uh, construction or house construction impossible. It just doesn't work. you got to build on pylons. I think it's important to know that this is how Corbata Uruguay looks. It ain't impressive. It ain't that big a deal, right? You see? Tiny little thing. Prefab structures on pylons. Boop, boop, boop. Look at this little gate. Look at, these little, look at their little fence. Okay, anyway. My visual aid. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so here we go. So they don't do anything with it. They just kick the guys off and they just leave the prefab structures. Why? Why not? Who cares? It's prefab structures on pylons. In fact, the Brits, the British probably figure, hey, it's a scientific outpost with some equipment there, some supplies there. We, we have missions that go around all this time. And again, this thing might happen again. Leave it intact. Spoil of war. You got yourself a nice little scientific base. Throw a little couple of British soldiers there. They can take ice core samples to the cows. Come home, right? It's going to be beautiful. The sheep, right? Some Falklands Islands covered in sheep. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so they did not destroy. In December of 1982, a Royal uh, Navy vessel travels by Corbata, Uruguay, and sees that someone has raised the Argentinian flag. This, for some reason, pisses them off to no end, and they blow up the place. Okay, we, uh, you know, on, on I guess they, they assume that that was Argentina either trying to reinstate things or trying to get things going. Now, it's very important to know from the historical record that it is most likely, it is considered most likely by most historians, that that Argentinian flag was probably put up there by a Falkland Islands native, native who believed that Argentina was the proper place, loved Argentina, was upset about the end of the war, went back to Corbata, Uruguay, and said, oh, here we go, Argentinian flag, back up, right? So they blow up these little prefab structures. Not a big deal. They blow it up. Okay. Uh, that's the historical record as most people accept it. Now, it's a very short trip. We didn't go into a lot of nuance, but that's basically the Falkland Wars in a nutshell, including the taking of Corbata, Uruguay. Okay. I like that name. David Griffin now diverges from the historical record. Okay. David Griffin now will explain to us his own research into it and his own explanation of what really happened in the Falkland War, something that we've talked about briefly before. It's very important that you know and understand that that, Ale that David Griffin's primary source, his primary source for his not his his belief that there was artificial intelligence alien black goo at, at Corbata, Uruguay, in an underground base, is Alec Newwald, a New Zealand engineer who, like I said, in 1989, disappeared for 10 days. I'm not calling him a liar. I'm just saying New Zealand engineers disappear for 10 days in time, right? You know what I mean? You hang out with a guy from New Zealand, watch out. You may disappear for 10 days, right? In a good way. You know, oh, well, you got to end up in Tijuana. You know what I mean? Um, it happens. You know, watch out. They, they like the party. Anyway, not to be, you know, not all of them. Some very astute, sober people. Okay. I don't get the impression that Alec Newwald is. I think Alec Newwald is much like myself. I think Alec Newwald maybe likes a touch of the drop every once in a while. I'm sure, hey, you know, if you look at old, old pictures of Alec Newwald, he's, he's got some tie-dye on, so I'm sure, you know, no, it's from New Zealand. Come on, you know what I mean? He's probably a hippie kid, hippie guy. You know what I mean? And I, I like him personally. I've seen interviews with this guy. He's, he's affable. He's enjoyable. Like most people with a New Zealand accent, most Americans find him just devilishly charming. Put an accent on anybody, they end up in, instantly become like you know, you know. It's like uh, to take an okay looking girl and you put those black glasses on them, and all of a sudden they they, they go up. It's it's wonderful. Anyway, ah, uh, not to get too far afield. Okay, David Griffin. He diverts from the main story. Okay, and like I said, his main source of this is Alec Newwald, a guy who claims that he went away for 10 days with the aliens. When Alec Newwald is taken away by the aliens, and we're going to give this very short shrift, um, he uh, is, is taken by blue ETs, okay, and shown a series of things and a series of events. And one of the things that he, he claims, I guess he claims that he is shown is the Falkland Wars conflict. He talks about sometimes thinking that he was seeing a, a, a picture of something or, or a projection of something and thinking that it was in the Antarctic, but then realized it was the Falkland Wars conflict. That's where he got the information regarding the black goo being underground, the ETs having a base underground, and what the ETs were doing with the black goo underground. What is the black goo? Some ancient alien technology or ancient alien itself, right, who came to Earth maybe on a meteorite or maybe on a comet, but is now here, uh, you know, substrata, and it may have, it may be a weapon of war that is, is to be activated at a later point, or it may itself be some sort of nefarious entity that wants to take over and control things. These blue ETs seem to be hell-bent on trying to, quote-unquote, de-engineer it, maybe to remove the threat, de-weaponize it, make peace or communicate with it. It's unclear, but it's clear that the only source that David Griffin has for this is Alec Newwald. Whose, whose testimony is entirely based on what he experienced as a contactee, contactee and what he discovered as an abductee. Some people, like myself, may be inclined to say that that means that Alec Newwald's testimony might not be the great, greatest evidentiary support upon which one would believe or build this story. It's especially important to note this because he, David Griffin, has another source that he talks about, I believe an Argentinian science officer, I believe it's, it's attributed to said, was stationed at Corbata, Uruguay. His name is Carl Los, or Carl, it, it may, it's hard to tell whether or not he's telling us this guy's name is Carlos, or it's Carl Los, 
and it, easier ones possible because, like I said, the Argentinians were very, very uh, heavily influenced by the Germans. So you could easily get an Argentinian soldier with the name Carl, you know, with a K, right? Okay, so we don't know, but we know that he's an Argentinian science officer, and we know that he has told David Griffin that there is boo nothing underneath Corbata Uruguay. Now, bear in mind, David Griffin is going on a, on a research trail predicated upon two things. Number one, a contactee who says something did go down, and a dude who was actually there who says nothing went down. Who are you going to believe? He says that he likes Carlos, that he believes him, and he thinks that he's, he's telling the truth. But he's telling you that there's nothing there. Shouldn't we just stop there? Not David Griffin. We go on. Okay. We looked at the picture of the base. We saw the pylons, the prefab structure built on pylons. We talked about the permafrost. Oh, now here's the problem with, with a lot of the story, okay? Now, I, I think you've got to take it into consideration, okay? Um, <laughs> number one, okay, so these blue ETs who are now associated with the Argentinian government have got to work with this black goo. And they've got to do it, I guess, in a subarctic or freezing environment like underground or underwater, because apparently when the black goo is, you know, subsurface or frozen or cold, it's deactivated or, or ineffectual, right? So that's why the blue ETs are underneath there working with it underground. Now, dude, if you're the blue ETs, even if you're associated with the Argentinian government, right? Why the F, right? Why the F? Would you build an underground base in a hotly contested geographic region? Oh, gee, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd really like to go cheat on my wife today. Better go to her place of work. You know? It just is baffling. No military strategist would do this, let alone a military strategist maybe who's a blue ET. Can you imagine a blue ET saying, oh, man, where are we going to put this base? We could go to Antarctica, or we could just go, you know, 150 feet offshore and be in this beautiful frozen lake. There are bays to beat the band in the Falkland Islands. If you thought that they needed to somehow be close to the Falkland Islands for some sort of thing or this, that, or the other, that's where the AI was, whatever, you could easily do it in the bay, cut across to the AI, right, Black Goo, or even if you were going to do it in an underground base, you're going to build an underground base in a hotly contested zone. Maybe you got to do it. Maybe that's where the AI is. Okay, okay, what should you do next? I know, let's put a clearly visible and very upfront under, uh, overground base right on top of it. That's genius. You know what? The, the, every time the Royal Navy government goes by, and they go by all the time, why? Because this is a highly contested region between us and them, they're going to see our lovely base. Hey, let's put a flag up there. That's genius. Why would you do such a thing? It baffles the imagination no military strategist would ever say, we've got this great secret underground base. You know what we've got to do? I mean, maybe if you're you know, doing it in Manhattan, you've got to have some sort of cover. But you're in the middle of the wilderness. Just build the underground fucking base. Why go put something on top of it to, to, to show people, hey, here we are, here we are, here we are. And here's the other thing. Didn't I tell you that the whole uh, Corbata Uruguay was prefab structures built on pylons? Didn't we go into why they would have to have built on pylons? If you're building the, 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 the uh, overground base, Right, maybe to protect the underground base, it, the underground base is still exposed. Why? Because the overground structures are built on pylons. That, that means anyone can just get at that entry. There's no security there. Why would you do such a thing? It doesn't make any logical sense. Moving on. Okay. Da 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 da. -da. Yeah, right? And how, you know, okay, rational for places basically didn't need why is it uh, also, you know, why not just go under sea, like I said? Okay. I think it's also important to note that Alec Newwald is his source, right? Alec Newwald apparently was abducted in 1989. The Falkland conflict occurred between 1976 and 1982. I may be incorrect, and Alec Newwald may have prior abduction experiences, maybe at the time of the Falklands conflict, but it is my clearest understanding that his, his main abduction, this 10-day journey, happened in 1989, and he wrote a book about it called Coevolution. The earliest publication I could find for that book was 1997. These are years, if not decades, after the Falkland Wars conflict. Why is that important? Alec Newwald would have had plenty of opportunity to study the magazine articles, to study the, uh, the military strategy magazine articles regarding uh, Corbata Uruguay and the taking of the Falkland Islands. He would have simply known about the Falkland Islands conflict as, you know, New Zealand has got very close relations with, with Great Britain, you know what I mean? So it, it's un, it would be unusual to think that Alec Newwald had not heard of the Falkland conflicts uh, prior to his abduction experience, and therefore 
you know, could be easily, and then also there's a timing conflict, because at one point Alec Newwald says that he's seen the Falklands War, I guess, conflict, and maybe he was looking at, it's difficult to say, but for the, the my primary thing is, is that this guy could have had a, could have had easy easy time making making something up or tying things into the Falkland Wars conflict because it would be very easy for him to appraise himself of the basic facts of the Falkland Wars conflict, right? Okay, so there's also a lot of concentration made on uh, a kind of a cryptic statement that Thatcher at 58 minutes and 27 seconds of the part one and two. There's a conversation about uh, Margaret Thatcher, you know. There was a big kerfuffle about the Falklands conflict. A lot of people felt that, that Great Britain had overreacted extremely, extremely, extremely. Okay, you have to remember that Margaret Thatcher's, her primary, I guess, mode of operation, the Iron Lady, was to try and be as much like a dude as possible, right? Like most women in positions of power, like her and Golda Meir, uh, clearly, you know, the way that uh, Joan of Arc, the way that they became the first, you know, female leaders of their country was by being as close to a man. An attitude and affectation and behavior apparently as possible. A little bit of judgment there. Anyway, there was a sinking of a Belgrano, a ship, an Argentinian ship called the Belgrano. This was highly criticized by a lot of people. A lot of the international pacifists movement had a real problem with the sinking of the Belgrano because it was considered to be uh, either an accident by the British military or something the British military did not have to do. Basically, many, many Argentinian soldiers lost their life at the end of the conflict because the Belgrano was sunk, apparently on its way, escaping back to Argentina. Margaret Thatcher had a famous uh, debate with a noted uh, British uh, pacifist, and the British pacifist put to her the question, why did we do it? And Thatcher says, um, something to the effect of, I can't tell you now, but you'll find out one day. Now, these guys, David Griffin, Miles Johnson, and Miss Summerskills, jump all over this and basically act like, oh, that's it. She told us the truth will be coming out at a later date. That's just like politicians say. Can't tell you now. Military secret. You'll find out one day. We did find out one day. We know. We saw the secret diaries of Thatcher have been published now. We know the inside notes from from those from her 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 uh, her discussions with her top military aides. And we know it was a it was a bad call by the British. They really bloodied their hands on that one. It shouldn't have happened. They screwed up. And what do you do when you screw up and you're at Margaret Thatcher? You say, I can't tell you why I did it now, but don't worry, you'll find out. After I'm dead, <laughs> you know what I mean? Damn me in hell. She'll say, What does she care? She was an atheist. Anyway. Operation Keyhole. That's when they uh, they took back the underground. Uh, they took back the underground base, according to David Griffin. Oh, there's a lot of conjecture that you know David Griffin thinks that a lot of things that I think are very very normal to me are, are surprising to him. And I'm not trying to you know bang on this guy. I'm just trying to point this out. Basically, there's a lot of criticism that basically they they draw. David Griffin draws a lot of. Um, I guess, justification for the fact that there was an underground base on Corbata, Uruguay, by the fact that when it was taken, it was taken by um, the SAS, the Royal Marines, uh, with a frigate, an icebreaker, and a rescue crew. And basically the question is posed by David Griffin, why would they send such a huge expedition to a little tiny island to take back this little this little base? Well, hey, that's, that's easy to answer. Number one, we already talked about, the Argentine military is no joke. They would have no idea who was actually. Listen, I'm telling you, so you take 50 of Argentina's badass dudes or chicks and you put them into operation, you know, uh, in at Corbata, Uruguay. They could have held on if they wanted to. They could have fucked some shit up if they really wanted to. In fact, they could have just waited for the Brits to come on and then, you know, jump them. It could have been a, you know, any sort of guerrilla tactic, any sort of, uh, you know, ambush. So of course, when you don't, you don't. Go, uh, Sun Tzu is a great military strategist who's definitely studied by the British military and has continued to be studied by the best of U.S. military and international military by and large. Whether he's a historical figure, whether he's a combination of various things, the fact of the matter is that Sun Tzu's art of war is still studied to the, this day in military colleges. In fact, there's a golden rule, golden rule amongst a lot of military strategists and generals. If Sun Tzu said don't do it, don't do it unless you don't want to lose. Unless you want to lose. And what does Sun Tzu always say? Sun Tzu is you don't go in with just the bare minimum. You know, you go in loaded to bear. You make you over. Yeah, absolutely. You over prepare. You know. The other thing is this: is that a Royal Marine or a member of the SAS or SBS? I think some of them are called. Um, these guys, you know, to create a Navy SEAL, an Army Ranger, one of these Royal Marines, you know, you it's years of investment. It's like making a doctor. You don't get these guys overnight, and it's a severe financial investment, they do, and if you lose one, you can't just get another one off the shelf. You can't just get another clone off the shelf. These are real people. 
highly trained, highly trained, skilled warriors. And they don't just fall off a tree. So absolutely, you send in the Royal Marines, you're going to send them their typical uh, complement. You're taking an island, you're going to send your amphibious team, you're going to send your rescue team. You have to send the icebreaker. They make a lot of deal with the fact that, that they had more than one ship with them. The frigates, a military frigate is not going to make it in Antarctic waters necessarily. You do need an icebreaker, and of course you're going to bring your sub. You're going to bring your sub. Why? Because you don't know what other things are out there in the, in the ocean. It could be not aliens, just, you know, the Argentinians. How about that, guys? So whatever. So that's why they did that. That's why there were so many people at the taking of, of uh, Corbata, Uruguay. I believe that that's fair to say. Da-da-da-da. Okay, so... Um, oh, basically, okay, so what, uh, so that, that was when they first took, okay, so then, okay, so then they have to take it a second time when they see someone put up the flag, yada, yada, and at that point, they blow it up. Okay. Moving right along, do 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 along the highway. Ah, okay, here we go. Ah, part two concludes by talking about the Marconi deaths. Okay, so that's basically, that's it. What's the story between artificial AI, black goo, and the Falkland Islands conflict? Alex Newwald says it was all about the artificial intelligence black goo. That's it. That's your source. You got an Argentinian eyewitness on the ground saying, oh, by the way, I was at Corbata, Uruguay, and there was nothing there. You have the researcher saying that he trusts that guy, but then you have the researcher back in the play of Alex Newwald. You have a lot of conjecture about a lot of simple things that are very easy to explain, and you have a lot of things that are not even touched upon, as I noted. Okay, let's move on to the Marconi deaths. Basically, here's David Griffin's theory, okay? This is it. He lays it out. Um, the British royal government uh, military retrieves the artificial intelligence black goat. Do they fight the blue ETs? Do they have to capture any of the blue ETs? Do they negotiate with the blue ETs? It is not clear. Maybe you'd have to read uh, Alec Newald. But what is clear is that David Griffin then believes that the artificial intelligence black goat was brought back to Britain for use by their military. Okay, what are the Marconi deaths? The Marconi Corporation was an electronics firm and, and, a, and a, a military uh, research, private private corporation in Great Britain that worked often uh, very closely with the British government on uh, Ministry of Defense issues. Much like America, people talk about the military-industrial complex. There's an analog in Britain, small, fairly small because of the size of Britain. You know, you, can't, you know what I mean? Corporations, international corporations centered in, in Britain who work on you know, military technology on behalf of the military government, on behalf of the British government, to sell to the British government for profit. That's that's how it works. David Griffin, uh, in the 80s, um, there was a spat of very strange murder-suicides um, called the Marconi death. There was a, a book written about it by a man, an author by the name of Tony Collins called Open Verdict, basically going through these things and conjecturing and saying, what's up with these deaths? Why are all these guys, these young, these young guys associated with the Marconi Corporation, dying all the time under very unusual circumstances or somewhat unusual circumstances. That's the theory, okay? Tony Collins, at the conclusion of his book, is very clear. What does Tony Collins think happened? Tony Collins thinks that it was that these a lot of these deaths were unusual. They were probably murder, okay? But he links them to Cold War espionage. The fact that what the Marconi Corporation was working at the time was uh, telecom uh, communications or encrypted uh, telecommunications equipment for either you know tanks or, or planes. Okay, that's what it's attributed to. That basically, I guess the Soviets or their you know ancillary agents took out these guys under mysterious circumstances to either hinder or prevent um, these secrets going out, or that the British intelligence, the MI5, fearing that these guys were going to go out and do something like spill the beans or talk or take their shit back to India, iced them. Okay happens all the time, right? One thing I'm not agnostic about is the government killing its own people to cover up its secrets. That shit happens all the goddamn time. I'm telling you, baby, watch out. Book Open Verdict. What does David Griffin say? Despite the fact that the author, Tony Collins, who was an editor-in-chief in at Computer World magazine, Okay, he's a trained journalist, okay? David Griffin says, hey, but despite the fact that this trained journalist came to the conclusion that these were clearly, uh, un you couldn't prove who did it, couldn't prove who did the murders, but you could clearly say that maybe it was linked to the space, Star Wars program, or like I said, these t telecommunications technologies. David Griffin says, dude, come on, what are you, crazy? 
It's obviously the artificial intelligence black goo. They brought it back from Argentina in 1982, right? And these guys start dying in the 80s. Okay. You know what I mean? I've, you know, I'm sorry, but I just don't buy it. I really don't buy it. There's no reason to believe to buy it because the only source is a guy who heard it from aliens. Now, look, I've talked to aliens in the past, too. Were they in my imagination or were they real? I don't know. My mind is a fantastic, funny thing. And like we all know, am I just a, bar, a, jar, a brain floating in a jar and this is all just imaginary? This is all just holographic universe projection, right? Am I trapped in the matrix? Whenever I say trapped in the matrix, I wait for my phone to ring. I'm convinced that one day I'm going to be talking on YouTube. I'm going to say trapped in the matrix. Morpheus is going to call me, right? Okay. So, you know, he thinks that it's off planet AI. Mark, basically, so here's the other thing. So you're the British government, right? You just took back the artificial intelligence black goo. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to take it to your own secret underground base and study and, and do it yourself with in, internal military uh, agents? You know, like at Roswell, you know what I mean, or Area 51 like the Americans do? Or are you going to contact a private corporation and give it to them? And not only give it to them, but give it to them so they can have young, inexperienced, uh, uh, you know, of uh, computer programmers, okay, Private citizens start working with this artificial alien technology. Give me a break. Give me a break. These guys are, are programmers in Fortran 5, which was the la computer language at the time. You don't think that the British military intelligence had people that knew how to program Fortran 5? Dude, computer language started with the military. Oh, you know, this is just, I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. It's really, it's just, I don't know how people do it. Okay, ba 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 ba. Okay, so why is the artificial intelligence black goo here? So now we go just right into into speculation. At one and one hour and twenty nine minutes, you know, we're off to the races. It's an off planet AI. Why is it here? It could be a it could be a, a terraforming trigger that things on the planet went too far. It could wipe it out. They talk about the movie Prometheus all the time. And we're going to have to have a special episode on the artificial intelligence black goo that just talks about maybe a separate series that just talks about, you know, facts and fictions and whether or not any sort of government would say, oh, I know what to do. Let's let our secrets out there piece by piece in the media. That's a very popular theme. And I think that's just a canard. I think that's just pretext explanation for why I saw some shit in the movies or in the TVs that I thought was really awesome that I would love if they existed in the real world. So I'm just going to say that they did that. That's proof that, that it's true because someone made a fictional account of it. That's proof that it exists. Also, where do you think screenwriters come from? Where do you think novelists come from? Where do you think artists come from? They come from the same community you do. You think, don't think at the time that, that Ridley Scott was working, was helping to work on the uh, plot points and script for um, Prometheus, he wasn't aware of the fact that, the pe that people had ancient alien theories? Come on! There's tons of movies. The, the, when 2012 was coming out, they made a movie called 2012 to predictively program us. No, because they knew that 2012 was on people's minds. And if you made a movie called 2012 about what people were scared of in 2012, people would go see it. Woody Harrelson freaks out. He gets his paycheck. Da 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 da. The Arctic's land. Whatever. It's, I don't know. I don't get it. Okay, whatever. And then nothing happened in 2012. Anyway, whatever. Um, Victor Moore. Also, you know, Alec Newwald, in addition to his alien experiences, I believe claims to have a connection or a contact within a South African espionage or secret service or military, um, Mr. X. So some things are attributed to this guy as well. We don't know who this guy is, so I really can't tell you anything. Okay. Oh, you know, so that's it. So ends part, uh, and uh, part one and two. Okay. We made it. What time we got? 30, we're doing, I'm doing, we're going, I don't know if I'm going fast. I also want to say that I know that I got a little excited at that tail end of that segment. I may have gotten a little bit, you know, rough on David Griffin. Look, people have different, see different things and come to different conclusions. Let me just say this. I like David Griffin. I think he's got a brain in his head. We disagree about certain things, and I think that certain things, you know, he's, he's, he's putting a lot of emphasis on this guy, Alec Newwald. He's clearly a friend with Alec Newwald. They, they have an ongoing series of connections and interviews that they do with each other. Uh, so it's very much that fact, okay? Oh, I just also want to say that David Griffin is associated with Exopolitics UK. I think that's his, his, his 
an organization he's associated with. Okay, so that ends part one and two. We're going to go through the next videos, which were, uh, were part three, a video for part three, Basis 17 part three, and, and, a, and a video called Basis 17 part four. We're not going to be spending as much time on that stuff because a lot of it's repetitive. And it just goes into different areas, but we'll talk about it briefly. <sighs> okay, beginning with part three. Oh, this is where Miles Johnson, at the beginning of this interview, about eight minutes and 40 seconds, and starts telling a story about, I believe I've talked about in the past, that one of the things I like about Miles Johnson is that he was associated with pirate radio. He tells a story that I guess they received a, tr a transmitter, um, which I believe is a large, a very large piece of, of, of radio transmitter technology, um, from, I guess it was decommissioned from the government, that, that's how the, the, his pirate radio station got it, but apparently he says that it was covered like it had been dipped in black oil, and I was un unclear because I was thinking to myself, like, how, why would you not just take pictures of it and then send it back to the government and say, I'm not going to buy this stuff, what are you talking about, it's covered in oil, but then it's very clear that it was an etheric energy oil, and it might be have been invisible to anybody who wasn't kind of like turned on, like Miles Johnson is, I'd be interested to see if he clarifies that point at some point. Either way, I mean, it is what it is. He sees what he sees. It happens, you know what I mean? Maybe he's, you know, he sees, sees things I can't see, or maybe I just haven't seen the black goo yet. Eh, who knows? Anyway, they describe who is they. Oh, God. Oh, James Cab Casball can see the artificial intelligence black goo, too. I think that that's a strike against artificial intelligence black goo, not some sort of reinforcement. James Casbolt's got some real problems. I pray for him. I've got nothing against the guy. Okay, he's a father like me. He's got real problems. He's got real problems. He's dealing with them, I guess, as best he can. In the clink. Anyway, it happens. You get busted sometimes. Anyway, okay. Ah, assumptions out the wazoo. So this is what I mean. This is just, you know, on part three, all of part three, I just basically took these, these small notes because it was just a lot of repetition. If you were going to skip any of these videos, you could probably skip part three because it really is just, it looks like it may be outtakes or duplicate uh, da um, footage from that was also included in parts one and two, though they do go through some more speculation. But that's the most outside stuff, so I don't really like it that much. Okay, one of these mysterious Marconi deaths was this guy, Victor Moore. Guess what? His wife says it was legitimate suicide. That's the other thing. These guys act like there's no reason why these young guys would commit suicide. It, when they're talking about the Marconi deaths, but David Griffin con consistently and constantly says things like, "Why would this guy who just got this great new job kill himself?" It is so such a it's such an ignorant series of statements about mental health and suicide. It's not even funny. Now, granted, I agree that many of these people may have been killed, but I think many of them probably did die of sexual misadventure. That can happen. The other thing that these guys, turkeys do is that one of these deaths involved a guy who was wrapped in rope from head to toe, right, and somehow strangled or broke his neck, and the coroner said it was death by sexual misadventure. These guys act like, who would do that? Who would do that? That's just keeping your eyes closed. Come on. It's 2015. You don't know that people are into some freaky things? Or is any of us in the, in the audience today, if you heard that someone died by sexual misadventure because he was tied from head to toe with rope, would you really honestly say that that's, well, who would ever do that? I mean, you might say who would ever do that in some sort of personal sense, but I don't think you would think that they found him in a rubber mask. Where's the killer? Rubber, who put on a rubber mask? Tons of people. You into freaky things? Also, they consistently talk about a guy who they say has a puncture wound in his, in, his, in his buttocks, and they say that that's evidence that he may have been given something. No, the puncture wound was not in the buttocks. The puncture wound was in the thigh. Why would you shoot yourself up in the thigh? Because you don't want your employers to see your track marks. That also might be why you end up in Bristol. These guys act like it's crazy surprising that a lot of these young men didn't come from Bristol, but ended up in Bristol and commit suicide. Bristol happens. Okay. Moving on to part four. Uh, it opens with a discussion of coevolution. Okay, part four. This is the Margellans episode issue. I said it before in the introductory video. Morgellons syndrome is one of those diseases that is not currently recognized by the American Medical Association or CDC. I'm not saying that to say that Morgellons doesn't exist. I'm making a factual statement about the American Medical Association's recognition, the CDC's recognition of Morgellons as legitimate syndrome. Okay? That's just a fact. They don't recognize it. The British uh, medical establishment doesn't recognize it. There's no international medical organization that recognizes the existence of Morgellons syndrome. 
just one of those things. I said there's things like Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, diseases that are, you know, 80% of, of all people that present to a doctor in the United States of America are classified as asymptomatic. I think that was the last uh, statistic I saw by the American Medical Association. That means that 80% of the time that a person goes to a doctor and says, Doc, the left one really hurts, the doc doesn't know what's going on. They do a series of tests, but they may or may not find the conclusionary answer. Medical mysteries abound, and if you suffer from Morgellons syndrome or feel that you suffer from Morgellons syndrome, please understand that I'm trying to be as respectful as possible in addressing these issues, and I'm not here to trigger you or to insult you or call you stupid or make you feel disenfranchised. I'm merely here to say a statement of facts because Morgellons, in this context, we're not talking about whether it exists or not, okay? You tell me you're sick, you're sick. That's the way I think about it. You tell me you're really hurt, and I believe you, okay? Okay? Um... But we're going to talk about the context here of whether Morgellons is part of artificial intelligence black goo. And that's an important point because as we move forward in the Analyzing the Basis Project and looking at the whole operation of artificial intelligence black goo, Morgellons is constantly its bedfellow. Okay, what is Morgellons syndrome? Morgellons syndrome is a disease or disorder that's characterized by skin rashes, lesions, joint pain in addition to other symptoms, but those are the main ones, and fibrous protrusions of, of odd colors uh, from, from wounds or from the body, okay? The American Medical Association and all doctors who have currently looked at it have all come to the same conclusion, that either these were typical fibers that one would encounter in an everyday life, cotton fibers, uh, synthetic polyester fibers that are around that are on people's clothing, and that a person might have an exposed or open cut, and, you know, that it might touch or go then and make the person think that they've got something there. Also, people do drugs. Okay, one of the common reactions to methamphetamine addiction is well, the bed bugs or cocaine addiction or opiate addiction. They start scratching themselves. They're, they're an addict, uh, you know, in withdrawal or in serious uh, drug psychosis can just absolutely rip their flesh apart. In a dirty environment, an unclean environment, we could easily imagine this person picking up tons of particulate matter, scabbing over the particulate matter, and being discovered at a later point. I'm just saying. Or it could be synthetic protrusions or diseased, you know, fungus funnels from the skin. I'm not a doctor, right? I'm not your doctor. It's conjecture. They talk about this guy, doctor. Now, here's the, now here's one thing I do want to say. If I've got any sympathy... <coughs> for the Morgellons victims, and I do. I just want to say, I love you more than these doctors you're going to, because some of the people you're going to are taking you for a ride. Some of these people are telling you that they're doctors when they're not doctors. Some of these people are telling you that they're scientists when they're not scientists. You've got to watch out. My personal opinion is that you should trust major medical practitioners for major medical disorders. That's me. Take from that what you want. I also said that I don't trust people. Absolutely. They're fallible. They're witch doctors, too. I get it. Yes, absolutely. The only difference between them and a witch doctor a lot of times is the coat. I get it. I get it. And also, you know, um, they can be wrong. You know, it, it happens. Uh, Dr. R. Michael Castle, not a doctor, right? Not a doctor. Has an honorary degree from um, a mill, from one of these places. You go online, you go. It's a Christian organization. You go and you say, I want a doctorate in this. You pay them the money. And they send you the thing, you print it out, and you, there's your degree. You know, they, I guess they write your name down in a book, and there you go. So now you're on the Internet calling yourself Dr. Uh, R. Michael uh, Castle, Ph.D., or, or some such thing. Um, it happens. Where there's some speculation about the binary, uh, maybe the Morgellons is a binary bioweapon. Oh, man, this poor, if someone's suffering from, from paranoid schizophrenia and they got Morgellons in this, and they hear this stuff, this is why I'm doing this. If you're suffering... For more gallons, it might not be these things that people are telling you. I don't think it's the artificial intelligence black goo, and I don't think you need to think that it's the artificial intelligence black goo. You're not being invaded by a foreign entity. Okay, you're going to be okay, honey. You're going to be okay. Okay. It's a binary bioweapon. The, the agent would be introduced into the bloodstream. This is this is you know David Griffin. You know I guess free associating with or talking to Miles Johnson and Miss Summerscales about this. Uh, again, another guy by the doctor of name uh, Cliff. Uh, Carnicomi or Carnicom? Cliff Carnicom is another guy. He's not a doctor. Okay, the red wine spinning test. Uh, basically, David Griffin puts forward that if you take red wine, take a little, don't swallow, like we do with the wine taste, and then spit it out, 
if you see that there's uh, substrates or, or, or particulate matter or granules or something, that, that indicates that you've got the primary fungal infection of, of this, this, this more gallons of this artificial intelligence black goo. Such a load of crap. People have talked about in the YouTube comments of my own video, the red wine tasting thing has been debunked out the wazoo. How do you know it's debunked? People who go to red wine tastings, they all get the particulate matter because that is an aspect of how our, our, our saliva glands and how our, our biology interacts with the, um, the red wine. It's something called the stringency, I believe it's called. So it's nice if you see that. If you gave yourself the red wine test, congratulations. You don't need to worry about it. That's not proof that you got more gallons, so don't worry about it. If you got, know you got more gallons for some other reason, that's fine. But if that's the thing that got you scared, don't worry. It's going to be okay. You don't have it. 15 minutes and 55 seconds. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then we get into the chemtrails. Okay. 20 minutes. April 2010. Let's talk about the Deep Horizon oil spill. We all remember the Gulf oil disaster. Uh, the uh, There was a, uh, a, a drilling, an um, uh, 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 offshore drilling rig uh, called the uh, BP Deep Horizon that suffered a rupture and a leak. They're, they blew their, their tube, right? And crude oil started billowing into the Gulf War. Into the Gulf War, oh my God. The Gulf, the, 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 uh, Gulf of Mexico with extreme devastating environmental effects that still haunt the Gulf today. Oh, and really, I mean, it was, the, it was a disaster. I mean, it was really, it was, really, it was horrible, horrible thing to have to happen to planet Earth. It really was, it really was, and it's ongoing. This genius thinks that it's because the French government tried to go in with a submarine to get this alien black goo. Oh, yeah, that's right. That they, are, they, what they, weren't, they weren't drilling for oil. Don't you fall for it. Don't you think that we're still burning oil because we're, because we're dumb enough to not, to not adopt solar energy? It's not that we're stupid. It's that dirty little secret is that we're really trying to find this artificial intelligence black goo. Peace be upon you, my brother. There were so many private investigators, so many actors from L.A. proving that they were hot shit good guys by going into the Gulf of Mexico on their boats, on their cigarette boats, on their, their schooners, on their, you know, their sea dues, getting out there, getting you know, investigative uh, material. This, this, this area was so covered by media saturation, it wasn't even funny. The notion that anything there was going on in secret is laughable. You just couldn't do it. You couldn't get it. Any ship that came into the Gulf of Mexico would have had to encounter so much other um, aquatic traffic, you know, with, with other submarines, boats, frigates, what have you. It would have been insane to, to think that someone was going to be able to like slip in at that point. Okay. What's really the source of this? Guess what? It's Alec Newall who, who told them. Okay, so what happens? So we're at the time of peak oil. First of all, Dave Griffin believes in, in this thing called abiotic oil. No. There's no such thing as abiotic oil, I believe. Any theory about a abiotic oil has currently been debunked and discounted. A okay, how do we get crude oil? Uh, dinosaurs, plant life, things, organic matter dies, right? Sediment, the, the travel of time, sediments build up over and cover over those, those, those decomposing corpses and, and organic matter. Okay, and slowly over time, the pressure... Of, of the new uh, earth on top of it, you know, the new material pressuring down on it and everything, starts to turn this stuff into crude oil, okay? And uh, we dig down into, into it and we try and get it up. There was a theory called abiotic oil, which says that there's a type of oil that did not come or that this is not how oil is made. It's not created from biomass decomposing under the earth, but is rather independent of that, either existing of itself, or according to Alec Newall, came here on a meteorite. The current abiotic uh, oil theories have all been discounted and debunked, but, you know what I mean, you can't disprove a negative, and so there still are scientists who study the notion of abiotic oil, but it's not a serious study. I think it's very important to know that this would be a kind of a fringe science or, or a realm of study that just generally is considered not the place to go. Okay. Ay, ay, ay. 20 to Alex Newell again. No, okay, so it's this, this black nun oil. Okay, now here's what happens now. At 24 minutes, we, we are sent to, uh, David Griffin starts reviewing an article for, from Nexus Magazine. I'm sorry I screwed up. I did not write down the uh, date, the issue date, or the you know, publication information. This is silly, man. I apologize. You need to look up Nexus Magazine. And basically what it is, is first of all, Nexus Magazine is associated closely with Alex Newell. 
Fair enough. It's not owned by him. It's not operated by him, but I believe his good friend, a man by the name of Dustin Rhodes, or Duncan Rhodes, operates it, and he's he's tight with Alec Newell. I'd like to be tied with Alec Newell. Like I said, I think this guy's a very entertaining character, though I might not use him as, as my source of information for everything regarding things that happened on planet Earth that he observed somewhere else. Well, no, hey, how about this, Alec? What if they showed you some bullshit, right? What if they were showing you, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to throw these guys way off. Get that Alex Newell guy. Get, get me a New Zealander. And disappear him for 10 days. Let's show him some fancy things. Hey, maybe it wasn't the Blue ETs that, are, that, that took Alex Newell away at all. Maybe it was the government. We're going to dress up as ETs. we get this New Zealand guy. Yeah, it's going to be great. Anyway, uh, okay. you know what? I don't mean to make light. If Alex Newell felt any sort of traumatic experience in his, in his abduction experience or contactee experience, I don't mean to say that. I certainly don't mean to say that anybody who's a contactee or an abduct, abductee is lying. That is not my, my conjecture. That's not what I mean to say. I'm just speculating about things just like other people are speculating about things. Please don't be offended, okay? And please know that I'm not judging anybody, not Alex Newell either. You know what I mean? He might be 70-something. He still looks like he could... Pop my head off right like a daisy, so I'm not gonna mess with that guy. Anyway, 24 minutes. We start talking about this article in Nexus magazine. This article in Nexus magazine is a reprint of a series of, of dramatic uh, forum posts that happened at a website called GodlikeProductions.com, which is an open source forum where a lot of people talk about these new age, these spiritual, these conspiracy theory uh, things. Okay, Godlike Productions. Basically, the story about this article is this is as follows. There's a young man, okay, who has a girlfriend who works for the French government or French military. She leaves her government-issued laptop at home on. He sees that the, that the laptop is accessed or is accessing an open channel, and he's now discovering that he's seeing all sorts of data and information regarding what's really happening in the Gulf War. He, I guess, basically keeps a log of this, prints it out, sends it to Godlike Productions form, or posts it there in some fashion, it is then reprinted in Nexus magazine. Okay. A couple of, pro no, hey, what are you going to do? Um, number one, I mean, the notion that there was a, that there was a, a military-issued laptop, if it was in your private residence, sir, you know, it was clearly, if it was either whether it was connected by landline or whether it was connected, you know, via Wi-Fi, you know, the notion that, that you would naturally be accessing or open to an open channel, it seems seems speculation at best. Also, if you look at the content and the data, it's just the kind of shit that a troll would do. My personal theory is that this French man was a troll, and he was trolling Godlike Productions. Why do I think that? Well, like classic troll fashion, what does this article do? It starts off with the simple things first, and by the time you get to the end, that's when the fantastical things here happen. If anyone has been trolled on the Internet, or anyone has seen anyone troll, say, an interviewer or a journalist, which happens all the time, happened recently on, um, in America, where they booked the wrong guest. They booked a comedian instead of the actual serious guy that they were supposed to have to talk about something. The comedian took the gig, and what did he do? He trolled them. He started off by talking. They were talking about Eric Snowden. So the man starts talking about Eric Snowden. The woman is asking him a series of questions. All of a sudden, he starts talking about Edward Scissorhands. It's a troll move. I, I can't come in and start saying, blah, 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 right at the front. You'll know I'm a troll. So what do I got to do? I got to tell you, hey, man, I got some information for you. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. You you have reached uh, the Johnson residence. Oh, no, this this is mild speaking. Absolutely. Um, would I like to order that? Sure, I would. Absolutely. And, um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, no. Oh, and another, oh, you, but could you do me a favor? When you have the delivery guy bring it, could he be buck naked and greased up? Click. That's trolling. That's what you do. You start off normal, and then you get bizarro, and baby, this gets bizarre. Anyway, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Like I said, it's just basically speculation. There's no real evidence that this came anywhere. Da 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 da. Forty-four minutes and fifty-five seconds. We're going. They're going basically following the chronology of this guy, and it's literally like you know, ten fifty-five. You know, ten percent of all you of all submarines in the world are now in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Eleven fifty-five. The French sub is now trying to get at the artificial. Is is trying to get to the black goo. Now watch this. This is where it gets crazy. Here we go. Here, this is I believe a direct. This is paraphrasing a bit, but you'll get a flavor for this. Is when I feel like we're in full troll mode. If this isn't a troll. Baby, remember what I said. Started off simple, very nice speculation. This, that, this thing happens. And then all of a sudden we get to 2 minutes and 58, 44 minutes and 55 seconds. 
the PP confirmed. Oh, the PP, which is I guess is one of these subs. They're all they've got little names, and there's a there's a guide to tell you what the names of the things means. Is uh, the PPP conf uh, the PP confirmed the discovery of an unknown prehistoric organism through which nanoengineering at extreme depth and pressure morphs compounds found in this new oil uh, with um, seawater into gold. But the gold is morphine. Unknown prehistoric organism through which nanoengineering and extreme depth and pressure morphs compounds found in this oil into gold. Well, you got the whole, you know, in, into gold thing, which, you know, whatever. But more importantly, how is go it? Now, I might be wrong. I might have missed something along the line. And they, the Nexus article may have switched over from the play-by-play -play from this uh, Godlike Productions into some other data. But I, don't, I didn't catch it. So if that happened, I apologize. But I don't think that it did. I think you can confirm it yourself that this is what actually goes down. You know... If you're on a ship, if you're on a submarine, first of all, the French submarine is not going to do anything anywhere near U.S. terrestrial waters. The, you say what you want about the Argentinians. Let me tell you who's not an amazing fighting force. The French, right? You know what I mean? These guys do not have a reputation on the world stage for being the kick-ass bunch of commandos. I mean, the kick-ass commandos are pretty good, but unfortunately, the kick-ass commandos, if I was a French kick-ass commando, I'd want to say to myself, if y'all move to New Zealand, or Argentina, U.S., come on, you know, hey, whatever. Um, these guys don't have a great reputation for being great. They're certainly not great sub-pilots. They don't have a lot of submarines anyway, the French. Anyway, but anyway, so they go down there, and they're trying to get this stuff. If you retrieve a foreign substance with a submarine under sea, you're not going to be able to figure out in real time that it's a prehistoric organism, that it's involved in nanoengineering, and that extreme depth and pressure morphs compounds, you know, with this stuff, in, with seawater into gold. Why wouldn't you? How are you going to do all those tests? To positively confirm that either number one you got the right stuff and number two it's got these properties are you doing it in real time is it a case of hey oh my god got the black oil right here we'll go let's find out it's prehistoric notes of gold and seawater stringency test You know, it just doesn't work that way, folks. And by the way, I like I like productions, but if you're gonna take God uh, Godlike Productions form post, right, as your evidentiary support, baby, you might have some problems, right? You might have some real problems. Number one, the whole thing is is kind of ridiculous. The fact that there's just open random channel, and the French government is just downloading all this stuff to everybody. There's also a notion that that somehow that there's some sort of universal open channel that the Chinese, the Americans, the Russians could all use at a given instance to talk to each other. It's called open air channel communication. It's, you don't have a secret one that does it, and no government is it does that. There's a whole bunch of talk about Corexit. Why didn't they use the you know what was the Corexit for? I don't know. And then we then we get Alec Newwald's theory about this artifact that this all came here from the meteorite. And so concludes my analysis of basis 17. Right? In conclusion, I don't think that there's anything to suggest that there was anything about the Falkland War that we don't know about. That the Falkland War was a simple to understand political kerfuffle between Argentina. You know, here's the other thing. You know, there's sometimes when people understand that the governments of the world are silly and stupid, and there's sometimes where we seem to have to believe that they're universally like super people, like they don't screw up, like Argentina couldn't have put a foot wrong or overstepped their bounds. Argentina at the time was controlled by a military junta. What does that mean? It means the military were in charge. What happens when the military is in charge of any government? Stupid military decisions. It happens all the time. Why? Because there's no one there to check the reins. No one there to say, as the president of Argentina, I'm saying you're not doing that, military man. We're not doing something so stupid as to pick a fight with the Brits. The military guy says, oh, there's no one to correct me now, no one to check me. Send them out. Let's set up the, the, the base. Alec Newwald is the only source, the beginning and only source that there's anything associated with artificial intelligence, black goo, at uh, Corbata, Uruguay, or at the Falkland Islands. That's a fact. That's a fact. Now, he could be right. He could be absolutely correct. Or he could be wrong. But I think it's important to know what our sources of information for, because it helps us judge those sources of information and judge the value of the information that is generated thereabouts. Okay. Also, it's important to note that, look, when he's got all the sources that say nothing happens in Corbata, Uruguay, that he ignores. He's got he's got a, a, a source for these Marconi deaths, but this, the, all the investigators who have already 
looked into the Marconi deaths all say the same thing. Well, number one, guess what? Guess what it turns out to be the fact of the Marconi deaths? Statistically, they're not anomalous. They're really not. It's easily explained by the statistical study and analysis of the age of these men, right? Suicide is the most common form of death, I guess, for, you know, guys between the ages of 18 and 40. I, I didn't know that, but apparently that's, that's the case. It's, it's, men commit suicide. These were engineers. Many of these were, were uh, Pakistani or East Indian engineers. They're away from their homes. They're away from their countries, even if they, they've got a supporting community. Sometimes young men take their own lives. And sometimes young men are murdered. But even if we take it that these young men are murdered, Star Wars is going on. They're working on military technology, but why would we assume that they're, that they're naturally working on an underground or, or secret military technology when there's so many obvious real-world explanations for the military technology that would have motivated some agent or actor to off these guys or would freak them out in some way, shape, or form? It's basically taken as a given by David Griffin that these guys were all being driven to suicide at the peak or prime of their life, meaning that it had to be that they were psychically driven by what? Well, clearly it's got to be the artificial intelligence black goo. If you don't believe Alec Newwald, then you don't believe that the that the artificial intelligence black goo was in the Falklands. If you don't believe the artificial intelligence was uh, black goo was in the Falklands, you don't believe it was retrieved by the British government there. If you don't believe it was retrieved by the British government there, you don't believe that it was retrieved uh, back to England and given to a private corporation to work on, right? And it didn't motivate the deaths of these young men. So what are we left with? We're left with nothing. My conclusion of basis 17 is that we've received no evidence, no evidence at all of any artificial intelligence black goo. No one has stated affirmatively that they've... Alec Newwald doesn't say that he sees, has seen artificial intelligence black goo in the Falklands in real time. He says that he observed it in Haven with these blue ETs who showed him this information, showed him this information, this screen ch -ch memory. Come on, folks. So that's what's up. At the end of Basis 17, I like David Griffin. I like him as a person. Sometimes when he's doing his interviews, he's wearing a, 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 a sweatshirt hoodie, like I love to wear, by a, by, a, by a company called Alien Workshop. Now, he might have just picked that up because it says alien on it, right? Or he maybe, like me, back in the day, you know, he, he shredded a couple of rails, man. Maybe that. You know, if you're ever in America, you want to hang out. I haven't been on a skateboard in a minute, brother. But who knows, man. Maybe we could shred some barriers or get to know each other a little bit over the boards, over the wheels. You know what I mean? I'll lend you my hot wax. It's cool. Anyway, so there you go. Ba 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 ba. So that's it. That's it. I like Dave Griffin as a person. I think he's got. I think he's got. A, I think he's got some research acumen. I definitely think he says some things about chemtrails that makes me think that he's skeptical and, and proceeds with caution about these things and doesn't always accept things as a given, which is a good thing. I think he needs to apply that rationale here. It might also be the case that this artificial intelligence black goo is not really something that is his main subject concentration, but he has talked about it and maybe at the request of Miles Johnson or the request of the Basis Project is now speaking forth or talking about it. I'm not aware of him writing any book on the subject. I'd be interested in reading it. Anyway, so there you go. That's it. That's our analysis of Basis 17. What's happening next? We're going to be talking about a young girl by the name of Sarah Rachel Adams, a very entertaining speaker, a very attractive woman. Okay? And as a bit of a forward, I think, when we talk about uh, David Griffin's problems, when we talk about Sarah Rachel Adams and the way that she's accepted or her information is accepted in the community, I think it is impossible impossible to talk about this. It might seem wrong. I sure hope it doesn't seem sexist. I really don't. Um, and I hope it doesn't seem, you know, uh, patronizing or insulting. But I think it's, it can be an accepted fact that Sarah Rachel Adams is an extremely attractive, the girl could probably be a model, as an extremely attractive woman like a Jessica Schaub or a Teal Swan. When I think about these gals, I think that it's almost impossible to separate the fact that they're getting 10 times the, the hits as someone like Adi Dasamraj, you know what I mean? Or, or Satya Sai Baba or Nityananda, not that I think these guys are, are, are legit. But I'm saying the, I think the reason why a lot of these beautiful women get hits is because beautiful people get hits. They do. It's unfortunate, but it's true. I have a strong feeling that maybe if I looked a little bit more like Sarah Rachel Adams or maybe, maybe Jessica Schaub or Teal Swan, even though they're not my type, I'm half Puerto Rican. Um, uh, a little too skinny for me, but whatever they um they're fine. They're, it's not that I'm trying to insult their their what they bring to the table, but I think that it's impossible to separate uh, their community's reaction to them from the the baseline fact that they're physically very physical attractive. Uh, let's go back to talking about just Sarah Rachel. She's she's an attractive gal. 
I think I don't think anyone could look at the good video of this gal and think that that she number one isn't attractive. You know, just in contemporary terms, you know, is this person? Do you think this person will be judged as attractive or unattractive by the people at large? I think the majority of people will look at her and say, yeah, she's she's a good a good looking gal. It is, you know, it's a fact. Also, she dresses the part. This girl likes to dress up. I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that that in any way, shape, or form flavors or is a commentary upon the information that she's bringing forth. But I do think it's something you need to take into context when you think of the popularity that she might have or the way people are kind of credulous to the things that they that people say. I can tell you as a trial attorney, it's a very simple rule of thumb. If your client, right, if your client or your witness is a very attractive man or a very attractive woman, they might just know the whole goddamn jury. It's hard to do. We're just human beings. So we're going to talk about Sarah Rachel Adams and some of the things that she talks about. I believe in basis 20 blah, blah, something. We'll get there. We'll get to that one in another video. Okay, man, I've had so much fun talking to you guys about this, and I hope you find this series entertaining and uh, edifying, okay? Good luck and God bless. I love you all. I love you all. I love you all. I don't mean to insult anybody. Uh, my sincerest respects uh, to Miles Johnston. My serious respects to, to David Griffin. My uh, sincerest respects to Miss Summerscales. And my upcoming sincerest respects to Rachel Adams. I'm going to not try to you know bag on anyone or hurt anybody's feelings. I just think we're just going to look at the information, talk about it, talk about the power of eyewitness testimony and what we think that that means. Okay? I love you all. Bye-bye.